Key Concept 3.6 focuses on European ideas and culture and the tension between objectivity and scientific realism on one hand and subjectivity and individual expression on the other hand. The first part of this key concept focuses on, on how Romanticism broke with neoclassical forms of artistic representation and placed more emphasis on intuition and, emo and emotion. Notice I underline and italicize the word emotion. If you can keep that as a key word for Romanticism when you take the exam, that will help you to differentiate how this movement, how this movement was different than the others. In many ways, Romanticism was a reaction against the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment hyper focus on reason and scientific knowledge was too much, and especially inspired by the French Revolution and some of the uh, excesses of reason, we're going to see, to see this reaction develop right afterwards. Um, yet, despite being a reaction against the Enlightenment, it was largely influenced by Immanuel Kant and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau's social contract believed that society and materialism corrupted human nature, and he believed that man was a noble savage in a state of nature, and emphasized this role this, of nature. Immanuel Kant's The Critique of Pure Reason accepted the rationalism of the Enlightenment, but preserved the belief in human freedom, the existence of God, and mortality, and, you know, helped to establish this as well, that, that reason couldn't be used to explain everything. Romantic artists for the most part, composers emphasize emotion uh, over reason. It emphasized the human senses, passion, and faith. It also glorified nature. It emphasized its beauty and rejected the Enlightenment view of nature as a precise, harmonious whole. It rejected deism. It encouraged individuality. It, it you know, encouraged personal freedom, flexibility, and the idea of emphasizing feeling and encourage intuition and the supernatural. Humanitarian movements were created to fight slavery, poverty, and industrial evils. And in some cases, it drew upon the ideals of the Middle Ages. National histories were glorified. Um, Walter, Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe focuses on faith and chivalry. And in Central and Eastern Europe, Romantic writers focused on peasant life. They transcribed folk, tale, folk songs, tales, proverbs. Think about the Brothers Grimm. For specific romantic writings, I would take maybe one or two from each category and know enough information to be able to explain their works and the impact of their ideas and beliefs. And so in poetry, the most influential are probably William Wordsworth, Sir Walter Scott, and Lord Byron. Sir Walter Scott uh, was Scottish. He wrote long narrative poems as well as historical novels, um, the most famous being Ivanhoe, which was a story of a fight between Saxon and Norman knights in medieval England, and he really represents the Romantic's interest in history. Lloyd Byron also embodied the, the Romantic figure, this Romantic nationalism, somewhat like Garibaldi. He actually joined the Greek independence against the Turks and died while fighting for them as well. And Sir William Wordsworth was also influenced by the philosophy of Rousseau and the spirit of the early uh, French Revolution. He believed that nature was a mysterious force from which a poet could learn and portrayed simple subjects in a highly idealized and majestic way. As far as literature, uh, the ideas to me that, uh, once again, the people, Von Goethe, uh, Victor Hugo, Mary Shelley, the Grimm brothers, all represent this romantic movement. And once again, you know, pick maybe one or two at most that you know pretty well. Von Goethe is the most famous German philosopher of the time period. Um, he, you know, his works um, like Faust was a tragic, tragic drama. Um, Faust sells a soul to the devil in return for the acquisition of all knowledge. Once again, demonstrating romantic criticism of enlightenment, rationality and empiricism. Uh, Victor Hugo wrote Les Miserables, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, and you know, romanticism in his novels was evident, his use of fantastic characters, strange settings, human emotions. Mary Shelley, best known for Frankenstein, you know, points up the, the whole idea of gothic uh, romanticism. Once again, in Frankenstein, she attacks the rationality that the fact that man thought they could build another man. And the Grimm Brothers, this collection of German folk stories, um, 
that preserves songs and sayings of German culture provides a strong example of how German nationalism and romanticism were tied together. Romantic art and music show these ideas of nature, showed the ideas of emotion as well. And Caspar David Friedrich, uh, this is his painting Wanders Above the Mist, which was just a mystical view of the power of nature. Um, this was conveyed in many of his paintings. Francisco Goya and the shootings of May, the 3rd of May, 1808, where he shows Spanish revolutionaries being executed by a French firing squad. Once again, if you look at the uh, Spanish, this was during the Peninsular War, and they look very innocent. Yet there was many, much guerrilla activity, and this was meant to show emotion, meant to rouse anger against the French occupying troops. Perhaps the best known romantic artist is Eugene Delacroix. And he was interested in the dramatic use of color. And his most famous work is Liberty Leading the People, which we'll talk about in a little more detail later on in this PowerPoint. But when this was uh, during 1830 and its portrayal of the 1830 revolution in France. Also, the music, uh, romantic music, played a, placed a strong connection with emotion as well as nationalism. Uh, once again, this is conveyed through the use of national folk songs. Beethoven was somewhat of a transitional figure between the classical and romantic eras. He was one of the first composers to convey inner human emotion through music. Um, and many of his later works were actually written when he was deaf. He was also the first composer to incorporate vocal music in a symphony. Uh, perhaps the best known of the romantic composers was Richard Wagner. Uh, he is considered the greatest opera composer along with Verdi during the 19th century. And his development of the music drama is often considered the culmination of the Romantic era. Uh, he was, like I said, a very German nationalist composer. He strongly emphasized Germanic myths and legends. In fact, he was actually hit Hitler's favorite composer. And Peter Tchaikovsky was the most well-known of the Russian Romantic composers. Uh, he often used Russian folk songs in his symphonies or his ballets, such as The Nutcracker and Swan Lake. Other works include the 1812 Overture. And this is just the example of, the, of folk songs and the creation of memorable melodies that were used during this time period of the Romantics. And the Romantic era returned to medieval ideas in certain respects. For example, Gothic revival architecture. Uh, would probably be the most famous example. This, this is the British Houses of Parliament built or rebuilt in the mid 19th century. Romantic writers often express similar themes while responding to the politics and revolution of the time period. Romantics believed in revolutionary movements that would give people more freedom and control over their lives. They supported the nationalistic movements that emphasized the cultural traditions and languages of Europe's varied peoples. And the revolutionary movements were highly idealized and probably not attainable in light of the political realities of the era, but the art tended to idolize these movements. Do keep in mind though, that the French Revolution of 1789 was not focused on romanticism. That was more of a, an enlightenment movement based upon reason, whereas the romantic revolutions of 1830 and 1848 are the revolutions that really are part of this romantic era. Once again, look at Liberty Leading the People. This is an idealized portrayal of popular revolution. And if you look, the, at this point, Marianne had become a very popular French symbol. Uh, Marianne was displayed in many places in France and she really symbolized, according to Wikipedia, the triumph of the Republic. Um, her profile stands out on the official government logo still engraved on the French Euro coins even today and appears on French postage stamps. And Marianne is one of the most prominent symbols of the French Republic. Like I said, to this day, she's still used on these stamps. Uh, it's not known that this is Marianne. This is one of the first uh, representations of Marianne. But, you know, you see this, the fertility, the mother of the Republic and these ideas that are once again preying upon people's emotions during this revolution as well. Following the revolutions of 1848, Europe turned towards a more realist and materialist worldview. The idea of positivism, which if you use the Spielvogel 
textbook is not even mentioned um, there, but it is something that is in the key concept and as specific and something you should know about. So according to Britannica, in Western philosophy, positivism is a system that confines itself to the data of experience. Um, you know, it, its definition is a philosophical system that holds every rationally, rationally justifiable assertion can be scientifically verified. Um, it is capable of logical or mathematical proof. And overall, in AP European history, on um, Quizlet, uh, where I was looking, Auguste Comte was the founder of positivism. And once again, this asserted that only scientific knowledge was valid and definitive. And it was very popular during the late 19th century uh, of this time period. Another important uh, person during this time period are the ideas and the works of Charles Darwin. Darwin is known uh, for uh, his works the, of natural selection and his study in the Galapagos Islands, Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador. And on the origin of the natural species focuses on the idea that over time species develop um, those that basically can't make it will become extinct. The, the, the idea of survival of the fittest. Darwin's works had a profound impact on Europe because it went against uh, the book of Genesis and biblical. Most churches early on were very much opposed to Darwin's ideals, but we'll see this theory of evolution as controversial make itself known in other ideas. Herbert Spencer popularizes the idea of social Darwinism, which takes Darwin's ideals and applies them to humans, to society. Talked about this earlier, justified the European conquest of Africa and Asia during the age of imperialism. It also would legitimize racism and make it uh, more acceptable, the idea that the European civilizations were superior. Marxist scientific socialism was the idea of communism, which we talked about in an earlier review. Uh, go and look, review that review if you want to look at that. That's, I believe, 3.3, key concept 3.3, uh, but also recognizes this more realist materialist view. And then the realism, the influence on art and literature during this time period was important as well. Realism followed the Romantic period. Uh, some of the art, once again, just like with the Romantics, I would pick one artist here. Um, probably the two most famous artists during the time period would be, uh, or maybe the one most, I would pick maybe uh, Gustav, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Gustav Courbet uh, for art. Um, very simple works, uh, rejected the idealized values, um, it replaced romanticism, it reflected the disillusionment men felt, many felt with modern life. Um, as far as writings, there's a couple. There's uh, Gustave Flaubert, who wrote Madame Bovary. Uh, he was actually put on trial for obscenity and violating public morality. Leo Tolstoy wrote War and Peace. And of course, my favorite, Emile Zola, uh, who wrote Germinal, and which was about French coal mining. Um, this idea of this you know, the growth of the socialists kind of portrayed the different classes. He also wrote La Semois, which showed the uh, influence of alcoholism and the destruction of just everyday life. Um, and then Charles Dickens would be another romantic writer. Uh, most of his works are kind of grim. And once again, they reflect the gritty realities of everyday life. The later part of the century saw changes in science and the whole Newtonian idea of the universe was really um, change with this focus on what was known as the irrational. If you look at Freudian psychology, for example, which develops during this period, we're going to see ideas such as the, the subconscious or unconscious, these ideas that um, suppress thoughts, uh, govern behavior, uh, the ideas of the id, the ego and the superego. And this focus on, on away from the scientific method, on this new ways of thought, are also going to develop in the natural sciences. Um, like I said, to undermine Newtonian physics, the idea of quantum mechanics, Einstein's theory of relativity. What I'm gonna tell you to do at this point really is to pause this YouTube here and kind of look this up a little bit. Look at the idea of Freud, um, study it just a little bit so you have enough to know, and then also look at the ideas of Einstein and the ideas of the irrational and what we call the new physics store in this time period.
And finally, modern art moved beyond the representational to the subjective, the abstract and the expressive. And this is expressed through the three movements known as Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, and Cubism. Impressionism basically is based on earlier Spanish painting and then the influence because of the age of imperialism of Japanese art and some um, African tribal art as well that represents a new enthusiasm. And essentially, if you look at it from a non-artistic point of view, I would say most Impressionist work looks fuzzy. It's not as clear or crisp. Most art historians would cringe that I'm saying it like that. And so a proper definition would be that it really, it represents a, the reaction of the artist to a scene, you know, portrayed what the eye could see with a single glass. And some of the names, uh, just like with the other movements, pick one or two. There's Monet, there's Manet, um, there's Renoir during this period. And so we've got just a couple of pictures. This is the Gare Saint Lazare, uh, the train station. It also reflects the modern industrial era. And just, you know, these art movements really were centered in France during this late 19th century. This is uh, one of the more famous works by Monet. This is another work um, by Manet, and this is a painting of Monet painting Manet, actually one of my favorite ones. But it also kind of shows this community that the artists were in. These artists were in big demand. They were well known. They were, they were, you know, they weren't starving artists during their time period. And they interacted with each other as well as with the general population. This is the work by Renoir. And this work shows part of the whole idea of um, the new city, the new urban areas. Remember, uh, Napoleon III had ordered uh, Paris to be rebuilt in the 1860s with the wide boulevards and the cafe scene and new leisure time of the 19th century that's reflected in these early Impressionist works. Post-Impressionism was a move beyond Impressionism. Uh, it emphasized the more realistic um, aspects of art. Uh, and its desire to explore more psychological effects, which keep in mind this was going on at the same time that Freudian psychology was entering the intellectual realm. And overall, some of the famous artists include Gauguin, uh, Cezanne, and the most famous, his most famous work, uh, Starry Night. Uh, he had several others as well, which are important to this period and, and show this psychological influence of this time period going beyond uh, the artist's perception more into even the subconscious or unconscious. Cubism best represented in the ideals of Pablo Picasso. Uh, Cubism basically uh, was a system where painters emphasized geometric patterns and portraying an artist or a situation. And this is one of the examples, one of the early ones, uh, Picasso's work. The most famous would be Guernica, which is a work we'll actually talk about when we talk about the Spanish Civil War in a later review. That is it for period three. Uh, we begin period four in our next set of reviews, which will focus on the 20th century. And until then.